Hi, I'm Nene Mitsilinic, and the, for the past four, four years, I've done various jobs related to software engineering, from being part of a blockchain startup, developing deep learning models for my master thesis, all the way to being around Kubernetes, like creating operators, uh, managing them, uh, managing clusters, uh, converting clients to Kubernetes, etc. Currently, I'm employed in a company called GRI, and today I'm going to present Kubernetes operators safety first for model checkers. Let's begin slowly with some motivation. I mean, you have Kubernetes handling everything for you. It handles uh, storage, networking, yada, yada, yada. So, of course, one would assume that with Kubernetes, building operators is easy, right? I mean, you can Google operator horror stories like Redis operator crashing everything or no issues in MongoDB operator. I mean, you would assume that naturally Kubernetes operators are kind of simple. They don't have a complex architecture. Something like a Postgres operator shouldn't be that complicated. Yet, you need a whole chart to describe it. Therefore, we established that Kubernetes doesn't solve all our problems for us and building operators still has some kind of a learning curve and adds its own complexity. So let's abstractly look how we build software. We build a product which has some quality, quality to our users, to consumers, to every stakeholder. The more time we invest into our software and in turn pay the developers to build it, the quality should monotonically increase up to some maximum value. So this is the first graph. As we gain more experience building software, we can de deliver better quality software in shorter time. We achieve this via better tools, for example, better IDE support, better debuggers, uh, better observability. We can have better processes, for example, how do you commit code? What needs to be some checklist you need to fill in before you commit code? Uh, uh, code reviews, etc. Or there could be some external stuff outside of the software, which makes writing much more quality software easier. For example, some regulation was released, you don't need to do it, etc. This brings us to a typical conventional approach for improving the quality of our software. So this is a typical things you would do when you build a distributed system on any kind of software. First, you have some design, some informal design specification, you talk with your core leaks, and you have a deep designer view. Does this make sense in this context? Is there any obvious shortcomings to this design? Like, will this crash the minute you put it in production? You try to catch as many of these design bugs early. Then you code it and you do static code analysis, where you have some tools which you annotate somehow your code and things might or might not blow up. You push it and you stress test it, or you inject faults in places. For example, if you have a network service, you inject that request to timeout or fail and see how your operators behave. You write unit tests for much more smaller testing pieces. And finally, you do code reviews where the implementation is checked by your peers for any obvious defects and possible code improvements. So this is all the conventional approaches we all know and love. Most of us have come across to them. Yet, there aren't enough. There is like more tools, more approaches, and this talk introduces one of these new approaches called model checkers. In essence, model checker is relatively straightforward, it's like a brute force search over all possible system states. So in some kind of formalish language, you describe your design as a state machine. You have a state of your system, you define a traditional function which are valid, so from which state of the system you can go next, even not deterministically. You define, okay, what are my assumptions? For this design to be right, what needs to hold? Those are invariants you want to check, or rules you want to check, and properties you want to check. So all this is what you are checking when you have a model. And the system performs more or less a brute force search over all possible states you, is, which are reachable from the initial state, does those invariants rule and properties hold? It's like, that easy. It's mostly based on set algebra. You have a set of states, set of reachable states, and the predicates on those states, part of the set of all states, are they true or false? 
So far, so you so good. And if you take anything from this talk, please read this paper. Use of formal methods at Amazon Web Services from 2014. Most of this talk is based on this white paper. It's amazing. It's immediately written. It has uh, both the pros and cons analysis in more depth, as well as a cool story I'm going to read, read and uh, paraphrase. So how did they come to this conclusion? Hey, we need formal methods. We need uh, model checkers. This is amazing. It's like a crime thriller. So in the paper, they actually shorten the author's initials when they talk about personal experience as just initials, so CN and TR. And the first one who came across this uh, formal model checkers is somebody called Chris Newcomb. So why is it building this distributed system super hard? Well, to first approximation, we can say that accidents are almost always the result of incorrect estimates of the likelihood of one or more things. So when we build some system, some program, we have issues estimating how likely is some error when this likelihood is close to zero. How likely could is some scenario to occur if it's one in a million? That one in a million sounds like pretty rare, but if your service runs a million requests per second, it happens approximately every second. Or how many times would this happen over the lifetime of the, your service or solution? which can measure years or even decades. I mean, there are all G, uh, GDS, global distribution systems, being run on super old hardware, or there are even mainframe PCs still running around code from the 80s or 60s. Like, somebody maintains the Fortran code or uh, COBOL code. Therefore, likelihood just increases. In the end, CN, our main actor and main protagonist, was dissatisfied with the quality of services he was written. I mean, despite all the best practices, they had bugs, they had production outages, they had everything we know and hate. So he dismissed formal methods because there were two various myths about them. Because they, he thought it takes a long time to learn, which is true for some of them. I had a class in a university about formal methods and some of them were pretty complicated and pretty less powerful than this one, less applicable. A second misconception is that only a small fraction of real-life problems fit this paradigm. So he thought his uh, rate over investment for learning model checkers would be pretty small or insignificant. This which brings us to the third point. Like, we as engineers have pretty limited time in our work schedules. We start working at some age between 10, 15 or 25 when we finish university, most of us at least and finish working around time when you are 60, 70 and retired, hopefully happily retired. So if you learn some method for two weeks, if you, this is like opportunity cost, you maybe could learn something else, maybe Haskell or whatever. Therefore, return on investment is important. He also thought they are impractical, that they are hard to use, uh, the tooling is horrible, which isn't true at all. It's fine, actually. Not perfect, but fine. And he found some white paper, a mystic paper appears. It has a title, Using Lightweight Modeling to Understand Chord. Chord 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 is a distributed hash table algorithm, pretty famous one. And they thought they had it, like design was super peer reviewed, everybody read the white papers, everybody agreed this is like correct. Then some guy, some woman actually, Pamela Ezeev, she decided to model it using Alloy, one of the model checkers. And when she modeled it using Alloy, she found that this design has a bug in it. It actually doesn't have all the properties of safety she wanted from a distributed hash table. And this paper stood the test of time. It had a 10-year test of time award at SIGOM 2011. So our actor, main protagonist, CN, read it and he was like, ooh. This is cool. Like, this can help me write better systems, better software. Like, this is super cool. But when he evaluated Alloy and compared it, like, what he needs this model checker to do on his problems, he found it limited expressivity. Alloy has a similar story still A, but it's a bit more limited. So he looked 
further and further and further. He found this funny thing paper called Fast Paxos by none other than Leslie Lampert, a Turing Award winner, also the inventor of TL. So, Paxos is the seminal paper from distributed system architecture, distributed systems uh, history, like super important paper. And at the end, there was a model Paxos, a Telea plus specification for Paxos, a design just more formal design, you can actually check up to some state size. Okay, this is good. Like, this is something we can use. And he was like, yes, we need to use this. Like, this is a famous, great tool. Like, please, guys, use it. It's like amazing. Please try it out. Let me know what you think. And people were like, okay, I'm busy. I have a pull request to review or something, something, something. So remember those misconceptions from like five minutes ago? Other engineers hate as well. So he was like, um, yeah, I need some really hard issue like for these algorithms to prove it and for somebody else to become interested and super enthusiastic like I am. So he found a project called DynamoDB, which at the time it was in his infancy. And here our second actor comes into play, engineer TR. He enters the story with DynamoDB. So he performed all the classical testing approaches, but still had some issues and he wasn't like super happy how the thing went. A couple of weeks with the Plus. So just a couple of weeks. He learned it, he tried it out. He found a bug in his design requiring 35 high level steps plus two more bugs. Uh, he found just a couple of weeks of TLA Plus. These bugs would surface in production in less than a few months under high load. Because 45 high level steps sounds like a lot, but when you're dealing with huge number of requests per second, it actually isn't. You know, remember the NASA guy previously? Underestimated likelihood of really bad bugs occurring. In his uh, retrospective memoir in this paper I mentioned, he was like, I wish I knew this sooner. Like, this is amazing. This would help me design better systems, systems faster and quicker. He was like, yes, please, yes. And it spread. Like many other systems at AWS are using this technique. So they wanted to somehow present it to other engineers. You know, now it's a marketing problem. We know we have a good product. It's like amazing technique, which can improve us to write more quality software in shorter time. But marketing is like formal methods. It's like, do not touch it. It's like, no, no, don't go there. This is like complicated. This is what hardware people do, not software. So they called it the bugging designs. It's much more friendly assigning term than formal methods. It's debugging designs. Even to make it more clear to the average programmer, even a novice one, it's exhaustively testable pseudocode, which is exactly what it is. You have some kind of pseudocode, which is a formal language. You can test whether your assumptions hold in this uh, system you design. Amazing marketing. And they use it in S3, DynamoDB, EBS, Internal Log Distribution Manager, whatever. If you have complicated systems, use it. It's amazing. And they found multiple bugs. They found some uh, further bug improvements. Uh, they found some performance improvements. We will talk about the benefits later at the end of this section, of, at the end of this historic section. So let's go to Microsoft. So remember the Telia Plus inventor? He wrote a book specifying systems in 2002, where he introduced this tool he wrote, Telia Plus. Around the same time, he joined Microsoft Research, did some things there, but not that related to model checkers or TLA plus, at least not that directed as in used in production systems. And then AWS was, um, hey, we are using formal methods. Look at us. It was April 2015. So their internal is Microsoft. They were like, hey, we have this guy who invented this stuff. So maybe something, something should happen. And there was like back and forth, back and forth. At December 26th, 2015, uh, at least according to my research, Satya Nadal, CEO of Microsoft at the time, he sent an email like Tila Plus is awesome, just do whatever you can with it, which was okay, let's do it. So they had a bunch of internal trainings, a bunch of knowledge sharing, a bunch of uh, dissemination of the knowledge and etc. And they use it a lot, like in Service Fabric, in a bunch of Azure, from Batch, Storage, Networking, Hub. 
And in all these instances, Tilea Plus has uncovered a safety violation even in their most confident implementation. So even after multiple senior sub principal or super principal engineers, like look at their code, look at the designs, they couldn't find this bug, which this simple technique found. I mean, I sound like a snake or helmet, like, hey, you don't need this. Your doctors don't want you to know about this tool, but it's like, yeah, they want to know you because it makes you write better software. And previously, other people used as well. Intel for uh, hardware stuff, Microsoft for Xbox and Azure, AWS, already mentioned. There is an OpenCom uh, real-time operating system, which is a real-time kernel which runs in the satellites, like in space. You need to have code which runs in space for a long time. And they managed to reduce their code base by 10 times because Telea Plus helped them design this system better. It's in Elasticsearch from some 7.0 onwards. It's MongoDB even has some specification for their distributed stuff, so it's used. Now let's cover the benefits. First one, you have improved design quality. Well, how do you get improved design quality by just writing it down? Exactly that. When we write stuff down, usually we think more about them because we express our assumptions or etc. So this is like writing what you mean so other people understand you. So you need to be more explicit. And then you recover assumptions you held, which are not necessarily true. Because you have better design quality, you have less bugs. Because you can verify some assumptions, some invariants, some rules, you can perform optimizations you wouldn't necessarily dare to do because you would be scared of safety properties. For example, sometimes you don't need to fully synchronize some operations. You can do it in a synchronous manner, which will lead to performance optimization because the synchronizing stuff is expensive. Mutexes are expensive, but you need to have safety property of the whole system. So you need to know whether it's safe to actually release some assumptions, release some constraints. By improving design quality, having less bugs, you can actually improve time to market because with this kind of tools, you have a design, you can quickly iterate on a new design, new design, new design. And last but not least, it's documentation. As you can see on the next slide, how do you explain your system design to another engineer or to yourself after a few beers and a couple of years later in a different team? So we have a three usual approaches. So one is informal model where you write prose. Like this is how it works. You can do it like RFC with mass student, etc. But it's like writing prose, not uh, like um, philosophy code, but this is how it should do. This is what we do, etc. This isn't really complex. It's not really super precise because there could be some ambiguities. On the other end of the extremes, there is code, which is super precise. This is exactly what your system is doing. It's super written, but it's like tens of thousands of thousands of lines of it and can be really complex to read. Model checkers, this model specification, this model checker language falls in between. It's a bit more complex than informal prose, but it's precise because you can check it. And when a new engineer joins the team, he can look at this more precise model specification and can, he can figure out what assumptions does the system have. And as the system evolves over time, you update this model spec and keep everybody in sync. And you can actually analyze whether you can do this improvement to the design. So here is some example. You have two Kubernetes objects inspired by Kubernetes. On the left is an object named bar for which the Kubernetes operator will create some object foo. Via generate name, it will create an object via generate name, and Kubernetes API server will fill the name foo something something for it. And we want to avoid operator which does this for you. We start by importing some stuff, so typical programming language 101. We define some variables. This is totally like usual day work. We define a bar object which has a name foo and has, it hasn't created the full object. We want to remember that. And we have a list of full objects which exist 
in the system. As you can see, it's a bit different syntax than most C or Python-like languages, but it's nothing like you couldn't learn in a day or two. It's not that difficult. So, usually when you want to check some properties in the system, there are two types of properties you care about. Safety properties and liveness properties. Safety, nothing bad will happen. You won't lose data. Nobody will die, etc. Liveness properties, something good will happen. Your system will protest requests. With all these methods, usually you focus on safety properties because they are much easier to define and easier to test for. Liveness, because usually you're not operating on some kind of hard real-time kernels or hard real-time hard drives. It's really icky picky to test and to specify. So focus on safety. We want to define safety property. No more than one full object will exist in this system. It will be our system invariant. So just one full object, that's it. And we start writing our algorithm. So far, so good. We have atomic start. We have while not bar object was created, do something, a controller reconciliation loop. At the end of this reconciliation loop, we assert we have exactly one bar of full object. Only the one we created. So let's see what's in those three little dots, our main reconciliation loop. We have uh, non-determinism. Oh, this is interesting. So we have a create object a atomic operation. You can even create a full object by creating it and appending it to created full objects. Or you can reboot during creation. So your operator can crash at any time. And you code this knowledge into this uh, design, this model. So object has been created, or you can crash and burn. Then what happens? You then mark creation of all objects true, or you crash and burn. And now let's run it. This is a uh, Tele Plus uh, runner integrated into VS Code. By the way, previously, this isn't pure TLA plus, this is something called Pascal, which less Lampard throw take it uh, after TLA plus. It has a nice syntax sugar, but in the end it's translated to pure TLA plus. So, where was it? We have an error trace. Okay, we found sequence of states which violate our invariants, which we define as a maximum of one full object exists. So let's investigate. We have a bar object, just one, which created this false and name is foo. Foo objects, no. And our program counter is at start. So remember this, this was start. A step happens, we are at create object. Okay, we are here and we want to create object. Nothing good, so everything's fine. And after creating an object, we create it, but then we crash and burn. Uh oh. So instead of marking it creation, we crash and burn and repeat this whole loop again. We crash and burn. We start again the create object. And we broke the invariant. We have two full objects generated. Why is that? Because in this code, we first create an object, then mark it as created, which is obviously a design error. It's a bug. With this, I finish my presentation and please ask me any questions you want. Like, I love this discussion. So let's start with Q&A session. Thank you.